nurseries of Lake County. Um, Lake County is the smallest county in the state, but yet it produces one third of all nursery stock that's sold in the, in the state of Ohio. So we may be small, but we're mighty, if you will. We have a long history of nurseries. As you can see, the nursery industry um, really peaked in the 1950s, but we've been around for a while. 1857 was our first nursery. In the 1960s, research showed that plants could be grown on top of the ground in containers. That was a new concept and that allowed them to be harvested year round and that really shifted the um, industry to warmer climates and away from our kind of climates. So it didn't matter anymore if you had the right soil in the ground because your container could go anywhere. That's a lot of what changed for us and why you see a slowdown after the 1960s. The Lake County Visitors Bureau still says there's over 100 uh, nurseries in Lake County. So we still are hardy, but we're not what we used to be. So how did we get this reputation? Uh, nursery capital of the world, uh, largest horticultural, floricultural nursery farm in the United States. That was 1910. And we become renowned for nurseries in 1957. That just how did this occur? And the answer is, well, it actually began with the Stores Nursery. And many of you have heard of Stores and, Nor Stores and Harrison. For those of you who are not, who have not, you're going to hear about them now. Uh, Jesse Stores was a skilled grower of flute, fruit trees in Cortland, New York. He visited Lake County, came just east of Painesville, and he decided that Lake County's environment was perfect for nurseries. The added benefit is the train lines had just been added to come through Painesville. So now he had access to trains to get his, what he was going to grow, his plants he would grow, anywhere he wanted to get them to. Because we actually are equal distance almost from New York and Chicago, which at that time would have been the big cities. So that was a big plus for him. He buys 80 acres of land in Painesville Township. And then he goes back east to get ready to move out here. And you la I laugh at this now because I can't imagine it. He sent his 14 and 16 year old son out here by themselves to start the nursery business. I can't imagine sending two teenagers to start the nursery business that you are putting your whole world into. But he did. They came out with two bushels of apple seeds and his father gave him a map of exactly where he wanted these apple seeds planted. And so they did that. You could, in essence, call uh, the 14-year-old the son, William, the Johnny Appleseed of Lake County. Uh, he planted those seeds, and within 10, they used 10 acres in the beginning. The rest of it was for growth. His father was thinking ahead. And they started Stores Nursery. That's how it all started, with two little boys, or teenage boys, planting some apple seeds. As a side note, um, Prior to Jesse coming out here and planting those apple seeds, Lake County was a dairy county. We were known for our dairy farms. So this idea of planting was totally outside of the box for them. The first four years, Jesse focused on grape cuttings, on of course apple seedlings, Norway spruce, and various um, fruit and berries that he brought from back east. The first customers were all local people, mostly local farmers. But then in 1858, life sort of changed. J.J. Uh, Harrison was a boy who had been born in England, moved to Painesville, and grew up here, but then had gone south to study in school. And he was very, had done a lot of studying on the science of grafting and was very intrigued by it. And he came back home, if you will, uh, and while he was here, he stopped by to see Jesse Horace, Jesse Stores, and he thought, you know, I want to talk to him about the nursery industry. I'm very interested. Of course, this is, the, you know, you think about it, we, you know, when you get out of college, you have this mind where you're still absorbing things. Uh, so he started talking to him, and they got a great conversation, and he talked about how he'd learned, he'd done some grafting, and Jesse gave him his experience. And he said, you know, I think I'd like to start a business. What do you think? A, a nursery business. And Jesse looked at him and said, you know, I do not think Lake County can support two nurseries. <laughs> so I think we need to join together and let's just do this together and then they can support us both. And that way it'll be a better answer. 
Today we laugh at the number of nurseries that have come through this county and at, and its peak how many we had. But uh, at that time, he just couldn't perceive of this small little farm county doing two nurseries. But they proved them wrong. I proved himself wrong. Uh, by 1910, they were the largest departmental nursery in the world. I mean, just think about that. They were the largest horticultural, floricultural nurse farm in the United States. They were Lake County's leading industry. They, <laughs> this is really funny, uh, they sent over 350,000 catalogs around the world each year. This is half of the Painesville post office's <coughs> income came from one business. Think about that. They employed more than half, they employed, sorry, they employed more men than all the manufacturing that was in Lake County at the time together. This was a big, big business. Now that's not to say they didn't have their struggles in the 50 years that they were in business by now. Uh, during the Civil War, of course, everything sort of shut down a little bit. And on top of that, three of Jesse's sons went to war and not all of them returned. So that was devastating for him. The, in 1872, not many years after the Civil War, there was a winter freeze and that affected plants in this area and that was a huge problem for them. And then the next year they had a financial panic, so no one wanted to buy. So there were some difficult years in there, but they made it through those difficult years. And here they are now, you know, by 1910, 1920s, huge. I love these pictures. I have some pictures I found of stores in Harrison's um, business. So this is their greenhouse. In 1891, it was 100 feet long. Now, I will tell you, this is a little side note that I think is just so humorous. In 1891, they used 4,000 tons of manure each year. They purchased it from the neighbors who were dairy farmers and other type of farmers. They paid $125, I'm sorry, $1.25 per ton for manure. So you're a farmer, it's like, you want my manure? Take it, take it, come on. I mean, be real here. What else am I gonna do with it? I mean, it's great for planting, we all know that, but I'm sure the farmers had way more than they could ever use for their plants. So they were thrilled and it made additional business for Lake County. This is their cold storage cellars. During the winter, they store their trees, vines, plants in cold storage cellars um, to keep them, of course, from freezing. They had a capacity of 12,000 cubic feet. And here's their office and seed room. Um, at its peak, the simple tree nursery that they started at became over 1,800 acres of land with fruits, evergreens, roses, bulbs, ornamental trees. A third of their land was devoted just to roses. A third of their land. They had become their own little mini city. They had 34 greenhouses, barns, a blacksmith shop, remember this is back in the old days, a general store, houses for some of their staff. They even had a school. And unfortunately that school closed just a few months ago, it was Hale Road. Yeah, it was sad to see them close just because of that long history that they've had. Um, I've heard talk, they're still trying to, I think, think figure out what they're gonna do with that. Uh, their cl the clock would chime the hour and everybody in town would look at their watch and set their watch to the, t to the clock of stores in Harrison. They were important in this county, needless to say. After almost a century of business, they had to close their doors in 1947, but their legacy lives on with all the other nursery industry that's come here. Many of the men who served here, as a, who served for them um, and had apprenticeships in some cases with them, in other cases were just laborers for them, they went on to start their own nursery business. And that's their legacy that they left behind. They, that's how we became known as the nursery belt, by, by all these additional people. Now, not everybody did this legitimately. Um, during the day, some men, they would come in with their lunch boxes and they'd do their work. And when they were alone, they'd snip a little piece and they'd put it in their lunch box. And at the end of the day, they'd take that home, plant it. And before too long, they had a little nursery growing. Isn't that nice? Now they're ready to start their own. And this was typical of what they did. And when they called them, they, uh, 
they called them the lunchbox nursery row, their houses, because it was all these little pieces of, of, of uh, stores in Harrison that got transplanted just by some odd coincidence. Mm -hmm. Often different family members would work in different departments um, so that they could learn more about the industry, the nursery industry. So Kohanke brothers, they all worked in different departments. One might work in accounting, another might work out with roses, somebody else out in ornamentals. There was a conscious decision that we're going to split up and learn as much as we can so that we can start our own business someday. That was the goal for many of the people there. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the different people who, uh, who came through there or who became nursery industry here. Not all of them came from the stores in Harrison, many, many did. The Kohanke brothers were one of those who were a lunchbox industry. There were five of the seven brothers went into the nursery business. Okay. One of the brothers was Henry Kohanke and he was one of the nurserymen who started at stores in Harrison but after 25 years, he decided he wanted to start his own business. He and his school-aged son started their own business. He founded Co Henry Kohanke and Son, and he bought two acres of land in 1903 and started building his nursery. Six years later, he was taking care of his fields, and it was rainy and cold and sleeting, and he got sick from it, and he died and he left his 22-year-old son in charge of the business. All right, so imagine, but he, was he just didn't think about the cost of being out in this horrible rain. All he saw is, I don't want my plants to be hurt. I don't want to lose my business. So his son took over the family, and he grew it from 100 acres to 1,000 acres during his lifetime. So he left a good son to follow him, right? Um, his farms went from Menor to Perry. People would comment, if it can be grown here, you will find it at Kohanke's. Okay, that's a nice little tag to have. Some recall that the Kohanke's didn't really like it when you came to, buy, to their shop and you would, what they called cherry pick. That is, you would came for their specialty items and then try to walk out. No, 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 you need to buy some of their bread and butter plants as well. And they would make sure you took a few of them with you. Uh, Henry Jr. Uh, retired in 1954. He sold the operation to Horton Nurseries of Menor, which of course is another family dynasty. And th when they combined together, that became the largest nursery in Ohio and the fourth largest in the country. I mean, we've got a good history here, don't we? Another group that you may recognize is the Clay Brothers and Donwell, Donwell? Donwell Industry Nurseries. Joseph Calais was an Austrian-Hungarian. He was an immigrant, came over 1897. He was 14 years old. And he began, once again, working at stores in Harrison. He worked for nine cents an hour, 10 hours per week, six day, or 10 hours per day, six days a week, plus he had to give one Sunday a month for free. That was the deal. If he wanted a job, this is what he had to do. His whole family, his, bro his father, his brothers, everybody worked at stores in Harrison. It was what you did, as I said, until you had enough to start your own business. Whether it was plants that you stole or whether it was money that you saved up, that's what you did. So even those who didn't do a lunchbox industry still went to stores in Harrison. They learned about Lake County and the nursery industry and they got some money and once they had enough to start, then they could start their own business. At 19, Joseph began working for Frank Rockefeller's estate in Wycliffe. So Frank Rockefeller, the son of John D., he had an estate in Wycliffe. Uh, it's now where the high school is. And he started working for them, and over time, he became the ground superintendent. He did quite well there. Seven years later, he quit to start a nursery with his brothers, and they called it the Clay Brothers. Uh, interesting, another little piece of trivia, the Clay Brothers published their catalog in Hungarian for 45 years. They are the only, uh, outside of Hungary, they are, or out, in the US, they were the only nursery business to publish a catalog in a foreign language. But what people don't know is at this point, which would be the mid-1950s, we had the second largest amount of Hungarians in the Cleveland area, the greater Cleveland area. 
So there were more, after Hungary, we were next, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. So it made perfect sense to have a Hungarian. If they spoke it, they could do it. Why not? And reach a whole new group of people. After eight years working together in 1917, Joseph decided he really wanted to run his own business. So he started his own company. He left his brothers. Paul and James stayed behind, and he started Donnewell Nurseries. Uh, Joseph was an, in, uh, an innovator in the nursery business. He held a patent for the Blaze Rose. It was the first ever blooming climbing rose, 1932. In his first three years, they sold over that he had this rose. They sold over 400,000 rose bushes. Um, how many of you guys have azaleas in your front yard, or in your backyard, or wherever? Yeah, me too. I love them. Um, you could thank Joseph for that. Azaleas were a wild plant. They were in the woods. And he, what he did is he decided there had to be a way to make them become, I don't know what, what, what you call it, but basically be able to plant them like normal, to become a domesticated plant, if you will. And so what he did is he studied the soil of where they're growing, and he figured out how to grow it commercially. This was 1926. Um, a decade later, he was selling 250,000 plants a year of azaleas. He was smart. He was really smart. Uh, he created hybrid rhododendrons, and he cross-pollinated plants to create new color varieties. After he cross-pollinated a plant, he would have to replant re it. Uh, you know, you, take, you plant it, you take the seeds, use it the next year, four years before you could get a bloom out of that plant to know what it really looked like. I mean, that's not, that's patience too, my goodness. Wayside Gardens, so J.J. Gruhlman's family had been growing bulbs in Holland since 1839. In 1918, he was on a bulb selling trip to stores in Harrison, and he noticed that there was a potential here for nursery business, and he decided to stay and start Wayside Gardens. Start a, new, start a new project here. A couple years later, Emler Schultz, a nurseryman who actually started a roadside stand in 1916, became his partner. And the two of them together really did a great job of growing Wayside Gardens. Their vision was to grow and market, market exciting and unusual and garden-worthy plants of the highest quality. They wanted to make sure the quality was good. JJ, with his marketing and business knowledge, and Elmer, with his knowledge of soil and growing, really made a good partnership, and by 1915, it was the largest perennial nursery in the country. You notice a lot of the largest, the first, one of the top. For us, our little county, it's so impressive. They had a huge mail order business. People would order from Europe, from South, Amer South Africa, and from South America. I mean, this is worldwide people are, are ordering from this little nursery. In the late 1950s, it actually received an order from an order form that had been sent out in one of their first few years. So, I mean, this is a really old order form, and the prices, of course, were quite outdated. So they proceeded to send a new form back to them and said, here's our new prices, now tell me what you want. Yeah. And they did get an order from them. Uh, besides their product, they also became for, known for their catalogs. They had a high quality color illustration in their catalogs, and they also included horticultural information. The, many schools and universities would actually use these catalogs to teach in their classrooms because the catalogs were so good. Now, I will say other catalogs were often used, but theirs was sort of like stood out at that time as far as what information was available. Coal nursery. So this is another nursery, early nursery. In 1881, William Cole planted blueberries on his land. And that was the start, Painesville area. Coal Nursery Company. For many years, they sold fruit trees, berries, vines, and shrubs. By 1910, they were the largest family-run nursery in the United States. Beginning in the 1920s, they expanded their merchandise to include flowers. They opened 13 garden centers, and they had a, quite a healthy catalog business going. With the industrialization of the 1950s, 
His grandson decided to sell their land and move to Circleville, Ohio. But eventually he closed down the Circleville plant too, but not before celebrating a hundredth anniversary year. Pretty impressive, a hundred years in business. From 1920s to the 70s, Mentor was recognized as the capital of the rose capital of the nation. Dozens of growers combined to produce over 5 million plants a year. The location was perfect for growing roses. In fact, it's consider, it was considered to be unrivaled in the United States at, for, compared to anywhere else. And one of the rose nurseries was Bosley Nursery. Um, Paul Bosley was an expert on the hybrid tea rose. And as with several of the other uh, nurserymen, he produced new plant variants. He created new plants. He created a hybrid tea rose called Blossom Time. It was considered the second largest selling climbing rose in the country, right behind the Clay Brothers Blaze. So we had the top two climbing hybrid tea roses coming out of Lake County. In 1960, he created June Bride. It was a pure white rose. In fact, it was so good that it was chosen to represent the American Rose Society on the, in an international competition in Europe. <coughs> The Klein brothers. So Gerald Klein, he came from Holland to sell his father's plants um, or his father's products. While he was here, World War I broke out. He was stuck. So he had to stay here for three years because he couldn't get back home. He did return home once he was able to, but then he came back a short time later and became the Midwest's largest gr rose grower. In 1968, he was awarded the Joan Ryder Rose Medal for high achievements and outstanding career in the rose culture. Uh, my understanding, uh, are any of you rose growers? My understanding is that that medal is comparable to like the Nobel Prize or the Olympic medal. This is a huge deal that he got that. Uh, Joseph Kern was a noted expert of old fashioned roses and for years he would provide old roses and old I use as a, you know, it's old fashioned if you will, whatever you want to call it, to Williamsburg, Virginia. In 1973, he actually got a call from a Hollywood producer who was looking for a Narita Rose, which was hard to find, and he said, I heard if anybody could get it, you might be able to. He was, built, he was making a movie called Prisoner of Second Avenue with Jack Lemmon, and in it was a character called Narita, and he wanted the Narita Rose to be part of this, to be in the movie. So he said, I'll pay anything you want for this rose. And Joseph said, that'll be $35. That's the cost of a rose plus transportation. That's all I'm going to charge you. I like it when they don't rip you off, don't you? All right. So originally, the Lake County nursery business was mostly mail order. But after World War II, the nursery business grew significantly and then expanded into retail shops. And today, we think, well, of course, retail shops. But back then, people thought they were crazy. Why would people walk into a shop? That's not what you did. You go out to the farm and you buy it from them. No one thought it would be successful, but it was. Sure, stores cropped up along 84 and 20. They were quite busy roads, even probably busier back then than today, actually. And instead of looking at pictures, you would drop, you could walk into, you could have uh, pictures of a plant and picking, saying, I want that. You could walk in and pick your personal plant out from the store. What a concept. You knew exactly what you were getting. There were no surprises. You had experts who could assist you right there and help you understand when you said, this is my soil, or this is what it's going to be beside. They could give you the best advice. It worked out perfect. And of course, as we all know, it's become a huge industry for Lake County along those roads. All right, so the big question, why Lake County? Why did Lake County, beyond the fact that we had a few men who came here, and started it all, what made Lake County so wonderful? The, what we call the nursery belt, I'll call it historic nursery belt, it goes from Mentor to Madison on a stretch of land um, along Lake Erie, six miles wide, 10 miles long. That's the nursery belt. But what's unique about it that makes it a nursery belt? Well, first of all, we have some diverse and unique soils. Millions of years ago, Lake County was covered in glaciers. You probably all are aware of that. And as the glaciers really left, 
they left behind lakes. These lakes then disappeared, and when the lakes left, their beaches became what we today know as, excuse me, North Ridge Road, Route 20, Middle Ridge Road or Narrows Road, and um, South Ridge Road, which is Route 84. They're, they're, if you look at a topographical map, you will actually see that there are higher points there. It's the beaches of these three old lakes. But when they left, they also left behind good and varied soil. And that is important. Some people claim 14 different soil types. I know somebody who's counted 14 soil types, so I know at least that many. But others claim as many as 17. We haven't figured out what those last three are, though. So multiple types of soil. And if you think about it, different plants need different soils. So in such a small area to have that many different soil types is pretty impressive. This makes it possible to grow a wide variety of plants with differing needs. Uh, those who wanted to plant roses, of course, went to Menor because that's where the soil supported those kind of plants. We also have the benefit of Lake Erie. We may all complain about it, especially when the, the snow hits us and we claim the lake effect. But it actually was made a perfect combination of moisture in the air, snow cover during the winter, and being a source of water that was important for making us the nursery industry. Our lake effect moderates the climate. So if in anybody who lives north of 90 knows that we have a much milder winter the first part of winter than people south of 90, right? And that's because of the lake. We won't talk about the second half of the winter. But, but that's true there. And it also prevents some extreme conditions from not occurring, the lake does. Uh, we have a larger, longer growing season. We're 193 days of growing season. That's much longer than you're going to find in most areas. In the spring, when the lake is still frozen, it keeps the lands cool. And when there's a possible ability of a late frost, the buds are still staying tight. The, the seeds are still holding themselves together because the lake is keeping it just a little bit colder until the light, that last frost is over, hopefully. If the last frost occurs after, we're in trouble. Uh, summer, we get cool air from the higher lands and it rolls down towards the lake after dark. And guess what? Leaves do and the plants need the dew. So this lake effect is humongously important for us, this lake, as to why this area was so important. The, the original three lakes, yes, that was critical. But also the, the having this lake effect is, it, next time you complain about it, just think, we have our business because of it. All right, the nurseries of Lake County are also uh, located within 500 miles of two-thirds of, of the U.S. population. Isn't that interesting to think about? I mean, like I don't think of us as central, we're here up on top, what are you talking about? But two-thirds of the U.S. population is within 500 miles of us. Even in the mid-late 1800s, back when the trains were just starting, because not as many people were west, it was 50% or more of the population was within a reasonable different distance of Cleveland. That's pretty impressive. Be with cat canals, trains, and of course now we have airplanes, that has only expanded our ability to reach whoever we want to reach relatively easily. So Lake County has a long history of nurseries that were drawn here by the optimal planting, um, environment. Stores in Harrison started the tradition, but their legacy still lives on in all these nurseries that exist today. Although we may be the smallest county in the state, we produce an, an estimate of one-third of all nursery stock sold in the state of Ohio. That's pretty impressive, right? All right, well thank you very much, I appreciate it.